All right, so, hi, I'm Allison. I, I'm the coordinator for the Gothenburg Global Biodiversity Center, and we live here together with Sea and Society, so we share this space. Um, our members are welcome to use any of the space here, so if you would like to be a member, um, you have to work for one of our partner organizations. I can talk a little bit more about that. And as Lena said, there's information here, so after the talk, feel free to wander over and read a bit more about what that is. And I'm going to be talking about linking these two goals here, uh, which I will probably kick over in the course of the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so I want to start with a pop quiz. Everyone is really nice, and the vast majority of you are not actually on your phones right now, maybe at 80%. Um, so get your phones out. All right, 33 players. Looks like we're not going up. 31 players. Two people just got bored. Um, <laughs> okay, we're going to start. So the idea is you have to get the right answer, and then the tiebreaker is how fast you answer. So get the right answer fast. <laughs> okay, and a little more challenging. Which of the following is not one of the sustainable development goals? <laughs> All right. Almost everyone got that one. Nice. Yeah, mapped Earth is not one of the global goals. <laughs> Dr. Centipede is still doing really well. Garcia is also. <laughs> oh, ooh. All right. How, what percentage of ocean species have not yet been named by scientists? Of those that have been found, hmm? in general. Of those that exist, of the oh. eukaryotic ones that exist. Oh. Aha! This is interesting. <laughs> so, those who said more than 90%, uh, recent estimates have guessed that 91% of marine organisms have not been named by scientists yet. That's a lot, right? <laughs> All right, we got a couple more. This one you're going to have to look at the screen. Oh, just kidding. Next one you are. So how many do have scientific names? We know that 9%, about 9% are named. How many does that equate to? <laughs> ah, and the majority got this right. Although about two-thirds didn't. It's about 200,000, just under 200,000 species. All right, now this one you're probably going to have to see the screen. So can you guys see that? What is the closest relative of that creature? And I tried to put it also in Swedish. <laughs> yeah, nice. It's, close. It's, a, it's a marine gastropod. It was a nudibranch. Really cool little creatures I'll talk about a bit more later. All right, and last question. When is International Biodiversity Day? <laughs> the most important day of the year. <laughs> ah, well done, guys. <laughs> so today is today. April 22nd is Earth Day, and June 8th is uh, the International Oceans Day, but May 22nd is Biodiversity Day. Well done. Um, so now that everyone is engaged and has some idea about maybe what I might be talking about, um, hopefully you're ready to listen to me talk about all those things that we just had some questions about. I'm really impressed with the background knowledge here, actually. This was <coughs> better than I expected, which is nice. <laughs> um, so I'm talking about the sustainable, the SDGs, the global goals. Um, and what are these? How many of you guys know what they are? Hands up. Okay, we got some like shy halfway up hands. <laughs> so this is, this, uh, it's also called Agenda 2030, and this is this idea that came out. It was put up by the UN in 2015, and the idea was that they were going to come up with these 17 very broad goals, and with these goals, if we are able to achieve these goals, uh, we will be able to live with a, uh, on a sustainable planet that is still here for future generations. So we have these different goals, and the 
idea with these goals is that we're going to be able to leave a planet that is sustainable into the future for human life. And as Lena was saying, that a lot of them are connected. Like we can say life below water and life on land are obviously somewhat rel uh, relative to each other, relevant. And then climate action, for instance, that's something that we can all see how that very clearly will relate to biodiversity, right? It gets warmer, the corals go away. It's something we see connected. But there's also um, some friction between some of these. And that's something that we also have to consider. How can we preserve biodiversity while we're still, uh, uh, while we have, uh, what is it, economic growth? Um, 18. 18? 18. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, so <laughs> decent work in economic growth. That type of thing, that, those are challenges. Those are not easy things. They're not straightforward because those are often issues that will collide with each other. So it's something that we need to think about. But these are all goals that are feasible. Uh, the UN has set out 169 different points that they will use to address these 17 goals. And each of those has one to three different uh, indicators, basically saying this is whether or not we manage to do that thing. So the two that I'm going to be talking about today are uh, the biodiversity ones. Um, and I'm talking about that because I'm part of the Biodiversity Center. I'm, the, yeah, I'm coordinating the Biodiversity Center, and we work with biodiversity, both on land and in the oceans and in the seas. Uh, and we have some pretty impressive biodiversity in Western Sweden, and we also have a whole bunch of uh, um, we have a bunch of different organizations around Western Sweden that are working with this biodiversity. And so, what the Biodiversity Center does is we connect these organizations. We have, um, in addition to six different departments at the University of Gothenburg, um, we're hosted here at the Department of Biological and Environmental Sciences, um, which half of the people sit upstairs, half of them sit up at Zoologen. Um, in addition to the University of Gothenburg, we have Universeum, we have Havatshus up in Lysishil, we have the Natural History Museum, Norden's Art, uh, one of the departments at Chalmers, and Botaniska, which is outside. So, all of these different groups are working with biodiversity in some sense, either through research or outreach. Uh, and what we are doing is we're forming a platform where the research and outreach can have a better connection. Because a lot of the people, a lot of the people working at Botaniska or the Natural History Museum, for instance, they, they may have done their PhDs here. They have a strong connection to research. Or even if they didn't have a background in research, they're interested in having that research to communicate to people. And likewise, a lot of the people here uh, doing research are interested in getting, they want to tell people what they're doing, because why are you doing it if people don't know and if there's no implication for it? So we're creating this, area, this, uh, this venue where we can come together and exchange, um, exchange our expertise and our possibilities to either do research or outreach. We have an excellent steering board. Uh, this is a picture of all of us uh, just a couple weeks ago. Um, up at Norden's Ark. Uh, we have a couple of our string board members here. Ellen and Lena are here, and I think that's it, yes. Um, but we have representatives from all of the institutions, and so it's a really good chance for all of us to sit down and say, what are you guys, you know, what's going on, and make sure that we have this connection. <coughs> so, a little bit more about these goals. So, if you go into the, the website, um, on the UN website, that talks about these goals, they have, they've sort of simplified the main points. And uh, you don't need to read these. I'm opposed to having text on slides in general because now you're just going to read that. Um, but the main point that I want to say here is that, uh, especially with the life below water, sustainably manage and protect marine and coastal ecosystems. Uh, conserve at least 10% of coastal and marine areas uh, based on the best available scientific information. Um, increase scientific knowledge, develop research capacity, da da da, um, to contribute to uh, the, yeah, the ocean health and the marine biodiversity in the, um, in the development of developing countries. So these are things that are dealing with biodiversity, uh, but biodiversity related to people. There's two different ways of looking at biodiversity, really. If we're thinking about conservation, we can think about it that biodiversity should be conserved because biodiversity is cool. And we can think about that biodiversity should be conserved because it does something for us. Right? 
And scientists are very split on which one is more important and which is the reason that we should conserve biodiversity. These goals are made in the sense of what biodiversity does for us. They are not there because biodiversity is cool or has some sort of inherent right to be here. They are there because it's something that is valuable to us. And so that's the context that we need to be thinking about this in. The life on land goals are a little bit um, more inherently for biodiversity itself, which is interesting. Um, specifically, take urgent and significant action to reduce the degradation of natural habitats, halt the loss of biodiversity, and by 2020, so we have one year to go, protect and prevent the extinction of threatened species. Um, <laughs> not high odds on that one, I guess. But it's important to have that on the agenda and to know that this is something that we are aiming for. And this, this one, the way this is written, is a little bit more in the sense of biodiversity for in and of itself. The rest of them, as I said, this is just a few of about a dozen. The rest of them are very explicitly about how humans use biodiversity, what we're eating, what we're, um, if we're cutting forests down, that type of issue. So this is the only one where it's really biodiversity for biodiversity. So I want to talk a little bit about um, where biodiversity is. So we have this goal 14 and goal 15. And I think that they've done a really nice job with putting these goals together, but I think that this one misses the point a bit. Because as much as these goals are very human-centered, this, like, this is such an arbitrary boundary. That what's the difference between biodiversity underwater and biodiversity above water? Except that there's this little layer between it, right? And that's because of the way that we think about it. So if we look at something like this little uh, island bit, we look out and what we see is, you might see the palm trees, some rice, you see what's going on there. And then you see this shiny thing and who knows what's underneath it, right? Um, so most people think that it's filled with sharks, <laughs> probably swimming in a pool of blood. Or at least that's what I assume whenever my head is above the water and my feet are underneath it. That's what's going on. Um, in reality, it's something a bit more like this. We have amazing coral reefs under there. We have this fantastic diversity. And it's something that I, I really think this contrast is amazing, how you can't see anything. And then all of a sudden, with 10 centimeters, you can see this entire other world. But the thing is, it's, it's really the same. It's biodiversity. It's these organisms that have evolved over millions of years uh, existing, doing their thing. And what difference does it make if they're hanging out in water or on land? And sometimes you get to see sharks if you're lucky. <laughs> so. And this all comes into a lot of how we perceive our planet. Um, so I found this really interesting. I found this a few, maybe a month or two ago. Um, this idea of how we see colors and how we describe colors. And depending on what your first language is, you might see and or you might perceive colors differently and be able to describe them in a different way. So for instance, in Russian, they have an extra word for what I would call light blue. This is fundamental words without these light, dark, these kind of these, uh, these modifiers on them. So the fundamental words. And it's the way that they are then able to group them. Right? So if you're a native Russian speaker, you will actually see colors in a slightly different way and be able to describe things. If we go back to ancient Greek, if you look in the Odyssey, they didn't have many colors at all. They were describing the sea as wine colored. Uh, it's, it's really, it's a different perception. And I think of like, if I'm doing a puzzle, be like, okay, I'm gonna take all the orange pieces. Do, 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 do. And you take all the orange pieces and then you have these kind of weird orangey yellow pieces and the orangey purple pieces and you kind of start collecting them because you're not sure where they go. And pretty soon someone comes in and they look at them and they're like, why is there you know, a green piece? And you're like, oh, well, it seemed kind of orangey at the time. And if we think of this in the same way, as species, way with species, um, like for instance, birds. What if birds are the color blue? But then in Russian, you might have owls and eagles. If you don't have the words to tell them apart, it's actually quite hard to tell them apart. You can say, I don't know, it was kind of bigger than the other one. It was cuter, it had bigger eyes. 
it, it's really, really hard to make this distinction and you get into this gray zone. So giving things names where we can talk about them is important. So as I said, 91% of the species in the ocean are not yet described scientifically. So how are we going to conserve these things when we don't even know what they are? That's a pretty fundamental building block, right? Like, let's save the fish. But what's the difference between a minnow and a tuna then, right? So this is, this is an important question. Um, so getting into a bit about what the Biodiversity Center does, there's a lot of research going on at the Biodiversity Center, and some of the most fundamental research is describing species. So these are a few different species uh, that have been described in the last two years uh, from different researchers. And uh, yeah, we have the stocked puffballs that Ellen has uh, been part of describing. We have slime molds, which were on a paper I was on. A uh, mongrel frog from Mozambique, uh, which a PhD student um, here was uh, part of describing. And this uh, new species of a plant called chinchona from Bolivia. And if we're getting back to what does this actually do for us, um, this chinchona species was described by uh, Klaus Peschen at the herbarium and Alexander Antonelli, who uh, works at the Department of uh, Biological Environmental Sciences, as well as Kew now. Um, this species, this one actually might do something for us. One of its closest relatives is the species where we get quinine from. That's something that we use against malaria. That's pretty important for us, right? <coughs> so while the slime molds might not be overly relevant to my everyday life just yet, Chinchona could be. So it's not that it's just these tiny little things that haven't been described yet. There's some really important big <coughs> stuff out there that is yet to be found. Um, and that frog, uh, frog that I just showed, um, that was by Harit Farouk, a PhD student here. And I want to talk a little bit more about another species that he's found recently. Uh, he has been studying the, uh, the fauna of northern Mozambique for many years. He's from there, uh, but he's doing his PhD between Portugal and here. And a year and a half now, he and a few other people from the Biodiversity Center went there and they were looking at the diversity on these inselbergs, these table mountains. Um, they look something like this. So they're these kind of dry habitats with lots of trees and there's stuff going on, but the thing is hardly anyone's actually looked at what's there. We don't really know what's there. And this is an extremely threatened habitat. So one night they were, uh, they had some sort of chaos. Uh, if you know him, you know that most of his field work is not straightforward. Um, and they ended up camping by the side of the road. And in the middle of the night, uh, they went out with their flashlights just to have a look around, see what they could find. And they found this gecko, which is pretty cool. It's a sizable gecko. It's a pretty big thing. Um, so they said, well, that's weird. And so they took it and had a further look at it and they found, yeah, this is absolutely a new species. Uh, there's two, other in, two others in this genus, but this is something pretty big and it's probably reasonably frequent and no one had ever found it before. So that one will be described soon, hopefully. Uh, back into the ocean. I'm sticking with not making a divide too much about the, the ocean and the, uh, yeah, the water and the land. Um, we have Kenneth Lindin, uh, who works at the Natural History Museum. He's also on, our, uh, on the uh, Biodiversity Center steering board. And he works uh, with these nudibranches. So that's what was in that one question. What is this thing's closest relative? And these things are fantastic. They're underwater slugs, uh, basically. They're gastropods, marine gra gastropods. And even in Sweden, they're not very well known. There's about a, uh, close to 100 species in Sweden. Uh, Kenneth's been involved in uh, describing at least three of those, and he'll be, there's a few more in progress. So even in our own backyard, we don't really know what's here. It's not just a problem of what's going on in Mozambique, it's a problem of what's going on in Gulmarfjorden. Uh, he also has made this awesome book with Klaus Malmberg, who took these photos. Uh, and if anyone wants to look through it, you're welcome to come look. They're the coolest things in the world. <laughs> And so 
it's important to know what species are there. And these are choices that we're making, like this is information for choices that we're making in the very near future. 2030 is basically tomorrow. And we can't be making these choices based on things from, that we know from just yesterday. We need to look way back in time to understand what is there and what's going to happen to it as we start to really do bad things to the earth or continue to do bad things, really. So we need to think about this in an evolutionary context as well. What happens when we don't have coral reefs anymore? Aside from a mass extinction, what are we going to be seeing in the next few million years? And a good way to look forward is by looking back. So two papers uh, that I want to just briefly mention are um, one that came out last week. Uh, Christine Bacon, who's an ass uh, assistant professor here um, in the Antonelli lab, uh, she and some colleagues uh, published this paper, Adjacency in Area Explained Species Bioregional Shifts in Neotropical Palms, which in English means that uh, basically species are more likely to have their closest relative in uh, an adjacent area in these palms. You're more likely to find a sister species in a close area rather than an area that's similar. So if you have a swamp and another swamp, but you have a swamp and a savanna, you're more likely to find sister species in those two. So there is an adaptation going on. The important thing to remember though is that this adaptation is happening over, happening over millions of years. It's not something that's happening overnight. So if we get rid of the coral reefs, it's not like all those species are gonna move into the intertidal or the deep sea and we're all better. But it is something to consider in the way of like how things are going to change in the future. And then likewise, um, there's another paper uh, by Alex Antonelli and uh, a number of other co-authors from the University of Gothenburg. And this was about Amazonia as the primary source of neotropical biodiversity. And so this was looking at uh, when you have species uh, dispersing, when they're moving uh, historically, which areas are they going to and from? And they found that by and large, many, many species were coming from Amazonas. But the thing that you need to look at more is this other figure, which unfortunately people on the sides can't really see maybe, where it shows within different taxonomic groups, within the flowering plants, within the fr uh, frogs, within the mammals, um, ferns, what are these patterns doing? And what you see is that it's not super, super clear. There's a general pattern, but what goes on in every group is really different. There's gonna be different things happening whether you're looking at birds or ferns. So, yeah, and that's something that we really need to think about when addressing these goals is how are things going to react? And if someone says, this is what the bears are doing, that's not the same thing that your, you know, primula is going, going to be doing. That's something that, like, it's, you have to consider these at different levels in different groups. And this is what we scientists love to do is take everything with a grain of salt. But at the same time, we also need to put out very clear ideas. Um, about this is what we suggest that's done because this is the general pattern. I'm um, going to finish up with a shameless plug for, uh, this is a book that I co-edited with um, Karina Horn in uh, the Netherlands and Alexandra Antonelli from here in Q. Uh, and this talks a bit more about this interplay about, um, we're specifically looking at mountains in this book. It's 31 chapters that are contributed from different authors. Uh, and we're looking at what mountains do to biodiversity because we have, it's really, really different uh, systems that are uh, in very small spaces. So you can, have, you can have different organisms doing really interesting things in small spaces. And it's really high biodiversity in mountains as well. So if you're interested in looking through that, you're welcome to come do that. Uh, and it's, it, it really shows how complex this, uh, this idea is where you need to be looking at um, the geological, the climactic, and the biodiversity issues together. So it's all about together. And then, and on this, the better informed we are about biodiversity, the more likely we are to reach this goal. 
And that's at all different levels. Um, we need to do the basic research, we need to do the applied research, and as members of the general public, engaging yourself is very, very important. Knowing the difference between different types of birds is a really nice start for actually understanding and appreciating what they are and the diversity out there. If you only see black and white, you're not gonna see the amazing different colors all around. And two ways to do that are Biodiversity Day, May 22nd, uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of events going on. Uh, the Garden will be having uh, yeah, a number of events. There's a program that will be out soon. Uh, we're also going to have an event up at the Natural History Museum where we're going to have uh, researchers from the Biodiversity Center telling stories from, uh, from the road. So their best tales of what has gone right and wrong during their field work. Should be fun. And then the Biodiversity Lecture. We had Peter and Rosemary Grant here last year and we're in the process of recruiting a new big name for next year. So look out for that. Um, along with information on how to join us, you can also get our newsletter, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and all of this information will be there. Uh, I will be shamelessly and constantly promoting it uh, leading up to the events. So please join us for that. And thank you. <laughs> That was during my other life as a dive guide. <laughs> <laughs>